Pushkin. I'm excited to bring you our episode today with Justin Timberlake. JT is a massive talent. Anytime Michael Jackson was asked about his successors in pop stardom over the last decade of his life, he'd mention two people he was proud of, that he felt carried the mantle the way he wanted to see it carried. Those two people were Usher and our guest, Justin Timberlake. Justin has had a career as a singer on some level since 1992, where as he puts it on his new album, Everything I Thought It Was, he's been making first impressions since he was barely 11. And for nearly all of those 32 years, he's had a really charmed career. Cast member of the relaunched Mickey Mouse Club back in 93, where he was co-stars with Ryan Gosling and other now luminaries. Then as a member of NSYNC, which along with the Backstreet Boys were one of the defining elements of late 90s and early aughts pop culture. And if that weren't enough, he launched an incredibly successful solo career where he found a musical soulmate in Timbaland who he's worked with in some capacity on all six of his solo releases. So with all of that hard-earned success behind him, it's been interesting to see the online drubbing he's been taking in the last couple of years. And I was really curious how he might respond musically. Turns out what he did was make an album that feels like a return to form. Everything I thought it was is everything you'd hope to hear from JT, including a surprise in sync reunion. On today's episode, I talked through Justin Timberlake's new album with him as he dissects key tracks from it. He also recalls how Michael Jackson helped inspire his solo career, breaks down the motivation behind each one of his solo albums, and talks about why he felt now was the right time to reunite with his boy band brothers in NSYNC. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Just a quick note here. You can listen to all of the music mentioned in this episode on our playlist, which you can find a link to in the show notes. For licensing reasons, each time a song is referenced in this episode, you'll hear this sound effect. All right, enjoy the episode. Here's my conversation with Justin Timberlake, recorded at Amazon Studios 126. We kick things off by talking about the last song on his new album, Conditions. I love that that's the first song you picked. It's gorgeous. Thanks, man. And you know what? Um, it, it was a pleasant surprise. One of the things I always loved to, about the first two albums is you ended with like these really, just really in your R&B bag. You know, okay. Never Again, another song. Yeah. Um, shout out to Rick Rubin. Shout out to Rick, who under Bigger Better Things. Um, and now Conditions. When did you realize you wanted to start making an album or put out an album? I had another kid and uh, needed to pay the bills. No, I'm kidding. Mm. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, So making this album was different for me than any other album. You know, to kind of go back to give you references, you know, Justified was, you know, me stepping outside of a massive machine of pop music because I really felt inspired to make music that I felt was more true to me. Yeah. Right. And I was also, I think it's important and, and we can get to it because that's been part of making this album is realizing that I really grew up in the industry. You know, I spent my high school years in the industry, my college years in the industry and with Justified, it was this overwhelming feeling. You know, I'll never forget being inside a stadium at Soundcheck. And it just, it, it was this overwhelming feeling, right? And the last album that I did with the group within Sync, like I was really getting into really, really, I think gaining more self-confidence in my songwriting. Mm. And and feeling like I had a, a voice in that way. Well, y'all wrote like, you and JC wrote like, yeah. 10 of those Yeah, cuts, we did the right? bulk of the album. Yeah. Right? And, you know, Gone in particular was a song that I had written for Michael and uh, Jackson. Sorry. I don't know if I'm going to say that. that if you're really... going to flex, flex all the way. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, and he had never heard it. And so I ended up taking it to the A&R meeting for that album. And everybody just freaked out over the song in in, in a great way, which is, you know, very gratifying. And later on, after the song had come out, I guess 
Michael had heard the song. He called me and he said, I want to do the song and I want to do it with you. And I said, well, it's it's out. It's already out. <laughs> you know, so maybe we can do like a... Because I think, you know, he was working on... A, it was I think it was the Invincible album. Right, that, would, that lines up. At that up. point. And he had, he had, you know, brought in all these songwriters to pitch songs. And I remember the conversation was, well, you know, the... the the record's out, the song's out. Maybe we can make it like a in sync featuring Michael for maybe like a reissue of our album. And then it can be Michael featuring in sync for your album. I was trying to figure out how and it I could. Think you had Stevie on that record too. So I could have been yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, you would have had yeah. the whole. Oh, you did. You, you, you really do this. That, oh, on, that was man. a good pull. That's another story I could tell you about. But we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. But he said, no, I want to do it with you. But for whatever reason, what was in the air for me and feeling like I really wanted to express myself in a different way. And then along with that conversation and a few other things that were just in the ether at the time, it led me down this path of saying, I've got to do it. I've, I've got to do it. It's this overwhelming need to do it. So fast forward to Future Sex Love Sounds. And again, it was just like it hit me where I said I had this overwhelming need to do it. And at that time, you know. Timbaland and I had had conversations about like sort of the absence of interesting dance music. Oh, yeah. And how could we flip that on its head? How could we do what we've done before, but really create a sound and something that feels futuristic? And that's sort of what led me down the path of, of the album title, right? And with 2020 experience, fast forward to that, that was one of the craziest experiences of making an album because it ended up being called the 2020 experience because we spent 20 days. I said, let's just work for a month. I'm not even, I just want to go in and make music. Let's work for a month. I said, we're going to take weekends off like regular people. Yeah. We're not going to be in the studio till, you know, 6 a.m. every day. And we wrote 20 songs in, in 20 days. Wow. You know, and you know, we brought in other players and producers and people that I was excited about, you know, and, and then Man of the Woods too, it was, it was the same thing. It was just like this overwhelming feeling to make this album. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I had had our first son and we named him Silas, which means man of the forest, you know, which I said, oh, man of the woods, that's an amazing thing. So like, yeah. you know, it was really more like, uh, that's what gave me the idea for, for that album as well but okay fast forward to to this album this album was different because i was ready to get back in the studio but i didn't really have a specific direction on where i wanted to go i just wanted to explore again yeah right which i think is a healthy place to start and at the same time i was enjoying my wife and I had our second son right. and I was enjoying the time that I was getting with them so much. And I remember someone saying to me like it, that it goes so fast, you know, don't just keep working so that you miss out on those like golden years with your children. So I thought to myself, well, I'll just go in the studio for kind of two weeks at a time, no real sort of end in sight. And I was also excited at this point to work with new songwriters and collaborate with them, work with some new producers, collaborate with them, along with working with, you know, Tim again. Yep. And yeah, it, it just became this process of like two, three, four years even. Of just going in like two weeks at a time, yeah, or maybe yeah. a little more. Or three or... weeks at a time, or even if you had a week blocked out. I will say two weeks just to sort of give you an Average, approximation, yeah. right? <laughs> right, right. And so I sort of, had this moment where I stopped and I was like, how many songs do we have? And it was somewhere between 90 and 100. You know, I'm looking at 100 songs. And so... At what point is this? This is... This was probably a year ago. And so then I said, okay, which songs feel the most special? And not with any rhyme or reason, but just give me the best feeling, right? That's a big task though, man. You know, 80, 90 songs... Yeah, it was it was yeah, it was right around 100, right around 100 songs. And it kind of got to that point to where some of them started feeling like connective tissue. They started feeling like symbiotic yeah. in a way. And so then I just started narrowing them down and 
perfecting those ones that I was really zoning in on. And that's the 18 that you that you have on everything I thought it was. Is that the feeling you had when you finally got to the 18? Like these 18 out of the dozens, this is what I was looking for. Yeah, I think I took a lot of stock into about 12 to 15 of them. Mm. And then kind of regrouped and said, okay, what do I feel like for me? What am I missing? You know, what color in the in the crayon box do I feel like I can add to this? Great. And I always have this rule too, when you think you're done with the album, like write one more song. Because something happens, I think, when you feel like you're done with an album that you kind of release any sort of subconscious pressure to live up to your own standards that you take a breath really like a figurative breath and then you write something crazy wow right and so funny enough that you started with conditions that was one later on in the process really yeah that was one later on in the process and yeah i'm i don't know i guess maybe every artist says this but i'm just so incredibly proud of this album as a whole because i really think collectively it's my most complete work from start to finish. That's amazing that you can end up with it being, feeling like your most complete work when you're, the starting point was no mission statement, not sure, you know, and the other ones you've seemed like you had that. Like, right. It's just wild to me that you can have created something that feels the most complete to you from this unknown place, starting at this unknown place. Right. Well, I think the other thing that happens as you get a little bit older and you gain a little more experience, even in life, is you have this ability to be able to step back and you're able to look at it as a whole. And and I think taking time with it, because I was also doing writer camps where I was, you know, we'd go in and write a song and I would say, look, this is not for me specifically. Let's just write a song that we think is great. Wow. You know, and if I feel like I can put my thing on it then I will go in and make it my own so I think having that time to digest a lot of the music it helped me with each song where in comparison making something like 2020 experience that felt so quick I definitely definitely sat with it for a while because we went back in Tim and I and tinkered with all the interludes and all the kind of transitions but I think I also, in having the experience of being able to work in in the studio at the level that I felt was my best and having time to live my life, as you go through life, you realize how important patience is. Mm. And if I did have any key word that was part of a mission statement, like you said, then patience Mm. was that because... I would go back in and tinker with each song so much until I felt like, okay, we can take that part out. Because tinkering sometimes is not adding, right? Mm, You know, arranging your song sometimes is almost like omitting a piece that you feel like maybe doesn't make sense to you within that composition, right? When you're listening with that ear towards arrangement, do you think you listen differently now than you did when you were younger, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago? I think you become more adept at being able to understand, but I think just through experience, understand, oh, let's try horns on this. Yeah. For instance, oh, this this section would be nice if we add an acoustic guitar. And then even, like I said before, no, 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 take take the synth out right there like let the track breathe while i'm saying this part over the song right and so yeah it's been an amazing process really the most gratifying process that i've had making an album because i really took this bull by the horns and was out front producing everything and i think also too just gaining more confidence and gaining more confidence because working with such great producers throughout my career you pick up so much, you know, you become a sponge in the studio. And I've been lucky to work with producers that are humble as well. They want to hear the artist's ideas. They want to collaborate. And I've always been that way. I enjoy collaboration so much. 
so I think, yeah, it led us down this path and it's dense, like all of my albums. But I also feel like, I mean, I've been in this industry since I was 10 years old, yeah, which seems crazy to say, but I don't think I've ever taken a moment to really just stop and look around and appreciate all of it collectively. You know, I, w- I would reference certain moments and say, oh, that was amazing. That was amazing. But I, d- I don't think I've ever sat back and looked at the whole of it to say, look at how blessed I've been and lucky I've been to have all these opportunities and to continue to work, not just in music, but in film and in television. And and so it, it's it's been such an amazing ride. I think this is the first time I really just stopped and said, this is really something to just to be gratified by. Was it having kids that allowed you to maybe have that perspective? I don't think it hurt. <laughs> you know, I think having children will teach you a lot about yourself. Yeah. You know, before I had children, I heard people say things like, oh yeah, they pick us. Like when I heard people say that, I was like, someone burning incense? <laughs> um, a little woo <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it felt a little guru-y. Yeah. But what I do believe is that they really show you who you are. And and I just, like I said, I think I just, I stopped for the first time and, and looked at all the places that I've been and all the things that I feel like I've accomplished. And that energy got put into this album. And that's really the title, everything I thought it was, you know, with every color of the rainbow of this life so far. Wow. And my passion being music first, to be able to have lived a life as a creator, I mean, it's just a really special thing. It's something that when you gain some sort of success and it starts to feel like, oh, let's keep this rolling, let's keep this Mm. rolling, I think that can be sort of a creative death trap. That urge to like, I gotta... Well, to produce something, to create something on a timer. Yeah. You know, to have this like pressure on yourself to do that. And I don't think it's any mystery that I take so much time in between albums because I really enjoy living my life. And it feeds me. It feeds me as a creator, as a songwriter and a producer and, and as an artist. It's fed how I even characterize my vocals on this record how i sing on this record wow how do you mean i just think that there's songs on this album that because of the way that i wrote them and because they were coming these ideas and feelings were coming out of me i mean we can continue to use conditions as an example when i go in to record the vocal it's almost like it's so ingrained in you that all you have to do is speak the lyrics Mm. in the melody that you've written because you know that the tone Mm. will come across in such an honest way. That emotion was really surface level right there. To simplify it, I didn't have to find it. Yeah. You know, some singers who, who are not songwriters and even songwriters that are singers as well, I've found too that in getting in conversations with them, sometimes they say, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel it vocally that day. Yeah. You know, and I never I never had a moment like that on this album. Everything felt like I call it the carbonation where if it if it's bubbling up for you, yep. then it's the thing to follow. Yeah. It's like if anxiety could be like a good thing. Mm. Like it's right on the cusp. <laughs> it's, it's right like, on the cusp. Like, it's yeah. like it, 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 you know, and all of these songs just when I went back to sort of review them because I've had I had different iterations of this album you know with some of the songs and and then I would write another song because I was just like well let's write another one let's see what happens and I don't know if you ever get to a point to where you're like this is it it's done but I think you get to a point to where you can say okay I can put that out in the world and let it live and feel good and feel good about it and it feels honest yeah After this quick break, we're coming back with more from Justin Timberlake. We're back with JT. You know, I hadn't really considered it until you were expressing that so much of this album, the vocal was just there, like the performance, the take was just there. You didn't have to find your voice on it. To a degree, do you think acting 
and honing that craft has helped the way the way you sing? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I've sort of talked about that my whole career because I get the question a lot like, well, which one do you like better? And I was like, well, you know, we're talking apples and oranges. Yeah. I like them both. Yeah. yeah. And I think what happens is I think we have this nature as humans to be divisive. And I, and I want to be clear about not even in a negative way. I mean, we can be divisive in a negative way. Sure, sure. <laughs> We've all done it, right? But I think we have to find the sliver or category for why something is the way that it is. And when I think about music and film, to me, they feed each other so much. I've been such a cinephile since I was young and I've been such a big fan of music since I was young and yeah I could sort of we could go back and talk about songs from my past and I could give you sort of a character because future sex love sounds to me when I was trying to describe to people what it was and I find myself using film references I said it's like if James Bond found himself in a Kubrick movie like he was in eyes wide like, shut or like or <laughs> like he was in yeah Eyes Wide Shut or 2001, you know, with how futuristic right. it sounded. So I don't know. I find that each one feeds the other. What was the reference on this one? Or like if you if you had one, film reference? Oh, man. I shouldn't have done that because now you put me on the spot. <laughs> yeah, if you don't have one, it's <laughs> No, no, fine. no. I, honestly, this album is the most me that I've ever been. And at this point, too, I've heard people say to me, oh, well, you don't you don't need to make an album. Really? People say that to you? Yeah, yeah. They say like, you know, you don't need to to do it. Look at look at what you've done and you know. And I'm just like, but I need to make music. That's something that on a cellular level is a part of me. Yeah. And I think that energy went into this. I think being a father and a husband, that energy went into this. But I think also having that moment that I talked about before where you really sit back and you're like, let me take stock in like, what does this all mean mm. at this point in my life? What do I want to do and who do I want to be? And I was just having those, those moments about my life and they affected who I wanted to be and what I wanted to say as an artist. Mm. And I found myself weirdly enough when i would play the album for close friends or people that i really respect like i would get a comment like oh this sounds like all of your albums before this in one album but new and fresh and then i'd get comments like oh this sounds like everything i thought i would want you to make and so it also led me to the album title everything i thought it was it's, it's, it's sort of true like there are moments throughout the the course of the 18 songs that definitely feel like in emotion, just feel like they reference other projects that you've, that you've done. It's incredible. It wasn't like this incredibly forefront conscious thing. Yeah. You're like Babe Ruth calling a hit. I'm going to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, to be honest with you, that to me is another death trap. Yeah. Like I said, I think the healthiest yeah. place to be is like, I don't know. Absolutely. I yeah. think, I think that's the most, important thing you can learn in this life as a, and as an artist or whatever your career is is to be able to say i don't i don't know which leads you to the path of of going well let me figure out what it means to me have you had moments where you've caught yourself feeling like maybe I, i'm acting as if i know too much here <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh that has to be where uh fuck around and find out <laughs> phrase is the most <laughs> relative you know what I mean because yeah I think you get to this point where you realize oh there's a lot that there's a lot of experience I have and there's things that I do know that I can always go back to as north stars in creating but that's the beauty of making music is discovering something about yourself about the music itself every time yeah. and I think that for me that's why I never want to make exactly what i did before you always want to find new new mountains to climb or new landscapes to explore and you definitely did some of that on here as well there's definitely stuff on here that sounds like it's like a new new color palette even as there's other things that sound reminiscent of things you've done there's some a bit about it that reminds me of like man in the woods some of it that reminds me of like 2020 but also just feels like 
different. And it was another one of the songs I was just struck by when it came on. This is really um, fun for me, by the way, because now that people are hearing the music, it's interesting to me if they're fans of my music to hear. I'm gonna let you play it. I don't want to like. Was a fun, I, I, said, I don't want to tee this up too much, but it's just cool for me to hear. Yeah what that means to them yeah this was one of the first times in a long time where I, I had a new album and i listened to it and i found myself really being surprised by my reaction to certain things oh you wow know? Well, amazing so, so well, and it, thank you yeah. but i think it also speaks to something else that i've discovered is that when you make music the success of it the biggest success of it is that it you finished it because it was somewhere inside of you yeah and I always think about the eight-year-old me that, you know, and big shout out to my mother. She played me so many different types of music growing up, you know, on the way to school, on the way home from school, on the way to the dentist, on the way to the, you know, wherever. You know, if I was to try to pick a playlist, for instance, or make a playlist from the time I was eight years old until I was like 14, it's so incredibly diverse. And that's because... I just grew up in a really musical family and my mother was such a big fan of all these different styles of music that she would play me so many different things. And I think about it a lot these days because, and probably because I have children as well, yeah. and I see how their influence, or they just pick things that they like. Yeah. What are, what are your you kids know? liking? They like everything. You know, my three-year-old's favorite song at the moment, Careless Whisper. And knows every word. What? Yeah. Did you play it for him? No, no. He, <laughs> my, I think my nanny, when she was putting him down for a nap, because I sing songs for them. You know, Smile is a big one. For Silas, my oldest, and Phineas, my youngest, you know, Smile is a big one for bedtime and nap time. I would sing Ribbon in the Sky. Oh, wow. We, we'd obviously go to things like Somewhere Over the Rainbow or things like that, but I would sing... A Song for You, Donny Hathaway's cool. version. Yeah, it's been interesting. My my eight-year-old is now at a place with like his friends in school where he's really gotten turned on to my music. Really? So it's cool to see him. He was, <laughs> for two weeks, he was like, Cry Me a River, Cry Me a River. He just loved that song. And then two weeks after that, he was like, Chop Me Up <laughs> from Future Sex Love Sounds. And I was like, you have such, you know, like, it's cool to see them experience all this work that you've put into before they got here. Yeah. You know, and yeah, he's he he's into it. So that's kind of bugged them out too, that it's like because again, like their experience of you is like their three years or their eight years of existence. For sure. And that you've had this whole incredible life prior to them. And that I think that that really boggles kids' minds, you know. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to have conversations with them when they get older, yeah. to kind of walk them through what it was, what it's all been like up until this point. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I don't want to stop. Yeah, 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 you know right. What I mean? No, no, but, no, yeah. But, I, but I, was, I was getting to a point of when you were saying, you know, whatever you're about to play reminded you of something from Men of the Woods and 2020 experience, yeah. because I was having this conversation the other day too, and I think, funny enough, I think Rick Rubin touches on this, where it's like, once the song's finished, and it's out in the world, your your work is done. Yeah. I remember when I put out Justified and I was like, I was so happy that that I felt like I made an R and B album. And then like the first week of reviews, you know, I'm 21, 22 at the time. First week of reviews, it's categorized in the in the pop albums. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it is you a know, banging R&B well, album style. Oh, uh, thanks. I mean, it's also a pop album. Sure. You know what well, I mean? What's the what really is it? Well, at this point, too, like, yeah. why are we even talking about genres? Yeah, yeah. Like, right. why? Yeah. Why? And also, too, like, why are we, again, this goes to maybe, like, our divisive nature as humans. Why are we so quick to say that it doesn't make sense for an artist to try something new? Yeah. To put on a different yeah. whole outfit and experience that for themselves, you may get something unbelievable. Um, it's yeah. like when Dylan went from acoustic to electric and it was like, you know, he would have thought he said something crazy, like, yeah. you know, his fans specifically. I mean, and I don't even need... he goes into like gospel and people like deride him for a lot. I mean, now people love those records. Totally. You know? Totally. So that's been a real lesson throughout my career as well to say, 
once you finish the song and the album and you put it out in the world, that's the beauty of it. That's to me one of the most beautiful parts about art is that we take it and we put it into our system and our life and we make it our own. Mm. And that is naturally going to make it something different. Yeah. You know, you think back to there's certain songs that if you heard out of nowhere might trigger uh, oh, I remember this summer when this song came out and yeah. all of a sudden oh, your senses go back to that place. Dude, when I, you, I'll be real with you. When, when I was doing a lot of listening for this, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays <laughs> came up. And I was like, yo, I hadn't thought about this in a minute. Yeah. And it instantly just put me in a it time It put you right where you were when you heard it. And it was a beautiful experience. Right? I was so happy to be back. Yeah. You, know? yeah. you like you smelled the cinnamon from the eggnog right? Dude, like when christmas was like you know what i mean i was responsible for nothing it was pure joy it was just exactly like, you, you know were just I mean? you couldn't wait to open up those presents that was it yeah. you know yeah but but i think it's been fun to see the reaction to people even closest to me mm. to yeah, how's your wife process this stuff like your music your new record uh well she loves it well, I mean, of Thank course. God. Thank of God. Course. No, but she'd be but... honest with me. She, There's actually a couple of songs that I wasn't going to put on the album that she was insistent that I put on the album. What were those? Um, Alone. That's a good one. I almost one played that. Them. Okay. Do you listen with her or is she kind of, you just slide it to oh, her? Yeah, and she, she comes, yeah, she comes to the studio and, okay. yeah. I can always tell when my friends and family come to the studio if I, if it's a song with tempo and we're getting the heads are bobbing and people are moving then we're on to something for other songs too like you can tell if you're getting a, a reaction by yeah. the people closest to you yeah who know you the best yeah but but it really made me realize again and i was able to metabolize it this time for myself that once you do finish that thing you know everybody's going to interpret it the way that they do yeah. and that's a beautiful thing yeah. You know, that's what it that's what it's for. That's what I used to do when I was a kid. You know, I mean, you go to an art gallery and five people could be standing in front of a painting and they're all gonna get something different from it. Yeah. Some and people I think, are lo love it, some people think it's shit. Some right. people think that I could do that. Some right. people can't. And by fathom. the way, and by the way, those reactions could be literally based on what happened to them fifteen minutes ago. Yeah. But that's the beauty of art. Yeah. Is we put it in our lives. I mean, how many times have I gone to a movie? Because before I had children, I used to like love to go to the movies by myself. I would Word. sneak into theaters and go to the movies by myself. Word. Sit in the back. It was best. Yeah. It's like the best two-hour checkout. Right? Can't wait till that comes back. Yeah. yeah. And you think you're going there to escape. But the first thing you do is you go, oh, I've done that. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's me. Or, oh, yep, that, that reminds me of my dad. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you think it's escape. You engage. <laughs> you start to relate. Yeah. You start to connect. Yeah. And you connect based on your own life experiences. Yep. And that's been a really freeing thing for me to really bring to myself. Because mm -hmm. I feel like it was always there, but I really couldn't. You know, maybe when you're younger and you, you have this healthy ego, you want people to understand who you are. Yeah. More than anything, right? I think definitely. Yeah. But they don't, you know, not fully. Only you can do that. And that's also a beautiful place to arrive to because I think it gives you gives you a layer of self-love that you didn't have before. So anyways, I'm rambling on, That's but beautiful. I want to hear what song well, reminded you of those two albums. Okay, let's listen to some Sanctified. Okay. It's a crazy track. Thanks, man. What was the initial spark for that song? Well, my co-producers, Rob Knox and, and Danger, along with my guitarist, I think the discussion came up like, can you make trap swing? And so that's why the drum sounds and the verses are the way they are. It's tight. Yeah. Sonically, it's very tight. And then, you know, there's there's blues, there's gospel, there's R&B, there's hip hop, there's rock and roll, all within this this one song. Yeah. And it was a little bit of a blackout making that song, but I remember when we were done, we just all looked at each other like, what did we just do? Yeah. That's a special one. Um, I love that song. I can't wait to perform that song on tour. That song's going to go crazy. You know, we did SNL with, and having Toby on it as well. I mean, yeah, Toby, yeah, yeah, Toby's on it. When did you get Toby on So it? I just got turned on to him. Like I stumbled upon his music and I just like went into 
a rabbit hole of the stuff he had done up until that point. Yeah. And I was like, man, this guy is incredible. Yeah, he's the truth, huh? And you ask him who his favorite rappers are, he's like, 3000, Lauryn Hill. I don't know who his top five is, <laughs> but I know those are in his top five because we talked about it. And you're like, it makes sense. He, he's just really, really special. And there was something about the gravel of his voice. He sounds like a preacher. And I was like, that's it. That guy on this song, I just want to see what he would do. And so it's funny, I, I set up like a, a, a FaceTime with him. He was like, I didn't even know you knew any of my music. And I was like, I'd love to collaborate with you. And I think I have something that I just hear your voice on. And he came and met me. I was working in Miami at the time. This is one of those like two week writer trips. I was at Danger Studio in Miami and I played it for him and he was like, it, it was like you saw this spark go off and he was like, okay, that's it. I'm getting on this song. It was like he claimed it. And that's when I knew it was going to end up being special. And his verse is insane. The verse is, in is awesome. It's, it's insane. Yeah. And he went into another room for like, I don't know, a couple of hours and like really perfected what he wanted to say on the record and listened to my lyrics. Because I had had the song done up until that point. Once I met with him and once... Once we actually got together in the studio, it was just like another kindred spirit. Man. Yeah, man, he's he's special, special artist. I want to play another one. Okay. We'll play a bit of uh, play. Mm. There's so much weird shit in that song, but it sounds like a club hit. It's like, what is going on? Like, Yeah, that's, I mean, it started with a groove. Uh, actually, Ryan Tedder sent, sent me the idea for that and he was like he goes i did something that you're the only human in the world who will understand it and he pitched that to me the same way i pitched sanctify to toby's like i just want to hear what you would do with this i was also in the studio with danger at the time and we both both got the idea and, and we just started beefing it up you know just beefing up the track because ryan had sent me just like a scale idea right and he had like a verse and a chorus idea and which is not far off of where we landed at the end of the song, at the end of creating the song. Yeah, it just, it's a, it's a vibe. Did, did it have the da, 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 that was, or I don't want to sing you to you and I don't know the words No, yet, no, no, go ahead. You know, nah, I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> no way, no. Um, I always do that to Timberland in the studio when he's like, man, when you sang the, if I wrote you a... And then he won't go up. And I'm like, no, keep going, keep going. Um, that's cold, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my, it's my brother, man. Yeah, it had that sort of like walk the, down yeah. at first in the in the verse. That was kind of an idea that I think Ryan had. And, um, and the co-writer who wrote with me, Michael Pollack, great songwriter as well. And yeah, it just needed the heel on the floor, so to speak. Dude, it has that feel of like... Um like parliament you know what i mean where it's just oh, yeah, thank you it's heavy yeah the bass he, drum boom yeah another shout out to adam blackstone who played the bass on that it's interesting too like there's a synth that there's a low synth that comes in on the bridge on that song that i don't know for whatever reason it reminded me of dj quick and i can't oh man i don't know why but i think if you like it's interesting you said parliament because i think if you if you go back and listen to a lot of quicks records as well like yeah. it's got that saying woo, yeah. woo, yeah. Yeah. you know he's got a lot of that i mean oh, shit, i love that quick's a reference for you man oh dude i mean one of the goats yeah but underrated 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 Under, criminally underrated it, yes you know? justice uh, for dj quick man come on i think he's doing fine he he seems happy i'm sure he's great but, yeah man, I, <laughs> I don't know him personally but <laughs> yeah. um actually my favorite part of the song is is the little outro part where you think the song's ended yes. and it's like we go into we bring the horns in there's and always like, a lot of tricky stuff too even like technical like it, it switches like halfway through like well that's my favorite song currently that's my favorite is song it currently your record. favorite yeah let's talk about it and originally those two parts had nothing to do with each other separate song just totally separate songs and the interlude at the beginning which i call never get enough interlude that's what we were calling it before and i think it was like originally a full step higher 
then Technicolor, and we were just working on that. Originally, Technicolor started with that reverse guitar that comes in as this what feels like the second part of the song. Right. And that would have been enough, I'm sure. But for some reason, we were working on that, on the interlude, and I said, wait, let's drop this to the same key as what we're working on with Technicolor. And for whatever reason, like all of a sudden, it just started making sense to me that this is just one piece of music. Because actually, when I played the album first, when I played it for my team, originally those two parts were broken up. Really? Yeah, they were broken up, and it was called a Never Get Enough Interlude into you, So you already had it? Like, it's Technicolor. Like a version of the album really had it separate. Oh, yeah. Wow. And then I said, you know what? This is just, to me, this is one piece of music. The first two minutes of it, which I guess to me are the interlude to the song. Mm. I don't know. I feel like they set you up for what it is. It just, to me, all of a sudden it was like, no, this is one composition. This is one piece of music. You're really not afraid to <laughs> <laughs> mash things together, merge them together, make songs longer than other people would would, sure. would dare make a song and is it something you're listening to coming up or what, like what is that that allows you to feel that freedom to not be confined to like just a typical pop song structure well it's interesting you have that book right there because that a night at the opera queen yeah you got a queen coffee table book right here for those of you listening there's a queen coffee table book when my parents divorced and I would go, you know, like on the weekends with my with my father. He had a record player and he had A Night at the Opera. I was probably about nine or ten years old. And I remember seeing the album cover, you know, this like sort of psychedelic art. And I was like, I want to know what that music sounds like. And I remember I got to Bohemian Rhapsody, yeah. right? And obviously that song's been referenced in so many different ways. Like you always think of like Wayne's World. Wayne's World, of right? course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But I remember thinking like whatever they were doing in comparison to the songs I'm hearing on the radio mm -hmm. that are three minutes at a time, there's no rules for these guys. Yeah. Whoever, whoever this is, there's no rules for these guys. And look at what it turns into. It's like it's an opera within itself. Yeah. And I remember also... And these are things that are just coming to me right now. So I remember also hearing the not faded out version of Gotta Give It Up by Marvin Gaye. And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, they used to cut songs short because vinyls only had so much space. Yeah. So you just would fade out. Yeah. That's why fades were a thing. Right. And not that that's like the reason to do it now that we have all any available space you want to make a song. Yeah. I don't know, it's just, it's a feeling. Because like you reference play, I mean, I think that song's like under three minutes. I think. I could be wrong though. Well, I'm no, proving your point clearly that I don't pay attention to how long or short <laughs> songs yeah. are because I don't even know what the time code is you on don't that even song. Care. Three and a half. Three, three and, and a half? half? Yeah. Okay. Well, without the outro, then maybe it's, there I don't know. know. Exactly. But yeah, I don't know. Sometimes songs should be short. Yeah. Sometimes not. After this last break, we'll be back with the rest of my interview with Justin Timberlake. We're back with the rest of Justin Timberlake. I want to go back to that Stevie story. You said you had a Stevie story. Uh, that's still in your mind? That's in my mind. No, that was just having him come in and play harmonica. I was... But how do you get Stevie Wonder to play harmonica? He doesn't do anything. You know, the answer is no to every question you don't ask, I guess. Mm. And I just asked him. And he said yes. And he showed up at the studio. And I remember it was... The NBA Finals was the Lakers versus the Sixers. It was the AI days when they finally made it to the playoffs. And obviously, Stevie being from Philly and me living, you know, starting to live in L.A. at the time, there was a lot of trash talking going on. They were just about to start. They had just both made it to the finals. And he was like, nah, man. I think he said something like, Philly in, in five. And I was like, What? I said, you do know who Kobe Bryant is, right? You know, and and so it was like we were just having fun with it. And he was like, I'll bet you dinner at Mr. Chow's. And he's he's still never taking me to dinner at Mr. Chow's. So I just want to make that public knowledge in case he hears this, that you Stevie, you still owe me dinner at Mr. Chow's. <laughs> he squelched um, on the, come on, man. <laughs> but yeah, like 
I just remember he finished one take on the harmonica and there were a couple of notes that were slightly out. I remember being in the in the control room and you have to I have to set this scene for you. Like Stevie Wonder's in the booth playing harmonica. I'm at the board. And I'm 20, maybe, at the time. And then it's like, some of the notes, I was like, ah, I wonder if he bent it like that on purpose or like, was that a stylistic choice? And like, even if I asked that question, is he going to be like, what the f- did you just say to me? You know, like, you, you don't know because it's your first time working with one of your heroes. Yeah. To me, one of the greatest songwriters of all time and one of the greatest voices of all time. And just like harmonica play just like when you when you when you think about people who are here to do something you could put Stevie like he, he from a very young age he knew what he was here to do yeah you know yeah he was on and, a mission yeah that mission was on him mm. you know what i mean like yeah. and he goes uh so what do you think and before i could even i was like i looked at everybody else in the studio i was like what do we say what do i say and he goes you know, the key of this song, I, it's, it's the only only harmonica I didn't bring for the key of this song. I have like four harmonicas. He goes, and I referenced it off of songs that are n- normally in the key that you sing. He goes, but you threw me for a loop. He goes, just give me a minute. He took one of his, and forgive me, like I don't, I don't even remember the key of that that song's in or what he had, but he took yeah. a harmonica that was, you know, tuned to be in a different key and came back and played it perfectly and then he was like yeah 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 that's it and i was like i mean he did like God. he did like three passes at it and that's when you realize like i'm in the presence of of the goat yeah you know like yeah those are the experiences when i talk about taking stock in all the incredible moments i've had with my heroes yeah. and where I feel like I'm at in my life right now, that's why it felt good to put this album out. Mm. You know, because I think back to those types of experiences and I don't know, they just, I'm like giggling at, at how it's all gone down, you know? That's a crazy situation to find yourself in at 20 years old. You've got Stevie Wonder coming to play <laughs> track and you're trying to figure out how do I, can I tell him? I mean, if you put me on stage with a with a guitar that was out of tune, it would probably take me a good five minutes to figure <laughs> out what to play for you. Yeah, you know. And this guy was just like, "That's when you realize, like that that guy is here to do this." It's insane. Yeah. Did it feel good at getting in sync back on this record? Getting, I mean, you guys did the troll soundtrack mm-hmm. as well. The troll soundtrack was fun, but it was a bit of a specialty item. Yeah. You know, with the plot of the film and 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 sort of the humor we were taking from it. Yeah, it was a bit and, like when Curb did the <laughs> the uh, Seinfeld yes. season. It was kind of felt like that yes. watching the trolls. You totally, know. totally. Yeah. But this one, funny enough, this is actually Paradise is the first song that we got back together to oh, record. Really? Yeah, no shit. So we did that one first, and then you know we did the Trolls record. Some of the guys did their vocals on, on the same day on both songs wow but i have finished writing it and i recorded my own version of it obviously with less harmonies yeah. <laughs> you know less stacked vocals yeah. but as i was listening back to it there was something in the ether again i don't know sometimes these decisions get made and you feel like there's like somebody tapping you on the shoulder yeah. to say like what if you did this and i feel like when it's so loud it's a moment where you say, what if we did? Yeah. And I felt incredibly gratified that my instincts were right about that because I think, I really think we sound amazing. Sound great. On, on this song. And when you break down some of the lyrics too, there's a, there's some of it that I think could be interpreted as how we feel about the fan base that supported us from the beginning and even up until now. Yeah. How we feel about each other. You know, we've been down a long, long road now. Look at where we are. We were chasing after hopes and dreams and we're still under the stars. Like Kenyon Dixon, big shout out, co-wrote 10 songs on this album with me, wrote that song with me. And when that lyric came together, sitting back listening to it, for some reason I just feel like I was having a conversation with my four brothers from NSYNC. And 
I was like, we, we got to try. You know, I, I got to send them this song. Or I got to play it for them. And JC was the first one I reached out to because obviously we share a lot of the leads. Yeah. And he came in and heard it. And I said, what do you think we would sound like together on this? And he was like, let's find out. Mm. And went right in the booth and it was just like, it was crazy because we looked older to each other, but it was like no time had passed. Yeah. You know, and we were back having fun together and, and recording the song and he sounds amazing on it as well. Another one of my favorite singers. Um, a great singer, man. Yeah, and and so did the other guys. I mean, just came in and, and it just felt like this amazing homecoming yeah. for us. And like, a, it's an amazing reunion. I'm excited for fans of us as a group, fans who might discover us from this song to kind of understand what we accomplished in that era. The specialness of it. Yeah, really, really special. Yeah. And and I'm excited. Honestly, it's it, it was one of the moments that got me really emotional yeah. in making this album because, you know, you have so much shared history and to have kind of, you know, gone our separate ways and uh, achieved things individually and to come back together for it to sound the way that it does. Yeah. It's like a perfect representation of how we should sound now, in my opinion. And that's why I pitched it to them. But also, even deeper than that, to have another moment with them. That who knows? I, I mean, you know, who knows what, what that all means? But, because I don't think you, you know, you can't look too far. Forecast it. You can't too, look too far in the forecast because mm -hmm. the weather changes, right? And everybody's got their own lives and things they want to do. But I had to feel good. To, I mean, because it's like, you know, there's all, I feel like they're over the years, y'all ever going to get back together? Y'all ever going to do something? It's, like, <laughs> it's kind of like, huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's kind of like being able to be like, kind of like must have relieved some pressure to where now if you want to, you can or not. Right. It's not going to be this big. Like, I think that's the way it feels for us. Well, I think what you're talking about is like that can happen a little bit with the, with the whole game of it. Yeah. Where a question gets floated out there and then it's like the whole thing becomes like your mother a little bit <laughs> yeah, where, yeah, yeah. where or like the stereotypical joke you could make about a mom where it's like oh she's a nice girl when are you gonna get married and yes. then you get married it's like hey mom we got married when are you gonna have a child you know it's like okay mom we had a child when are you gonna have another child you know <laughs> it can turn into that a little yeah, bit but true. i think for i think for the five of us i think we feel like this has to be on our terms and I think it also speaks to what I was talking about before for myself with this album is really enjoying this moment and, you know, savoring all of it. And I think that's that's what it has to be for us if, if there was ever going to be anything, you know. But I will say that I think when people hear the song and us on it, it's an emotional experience. Yeah. Man, just like what a blessing to have like all of the people you've been fortunate enough to collaborate with over the span yeah. of your career and just to have them there mm -hmm. when it feels right for a song or it feels right for a project right. to be able to pull and harness all like, you know what I mean? Like, wow. Right. Like, well, and it's not again, like this wasn't something that was a completely conscious thing. But now that I look at the whole album if you're calling an album everything I thought it was, <laughs> to have that portion included in a way that to me is so spectacular. Yeah. And again, the song itself, everybody's performance on it, we sound like us, but we sound like us now. We sound like the future of us. But also just to have the experience with them, it means a lot to me. Before we wrap up, can I play, can I play something... From That's another, it? from a well, can I put something from another? We record? can go over if there's something you, if there's records you really want to talk about. Just stuff on. I'm so excited to actually talk about the album. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk. Uh, well, Infinity Sex is great, and it's not what I was thinking from the title. Hold, let's play a little. What Infinity were you expecting, Sex. like? Some like Jodeci or yeah, I, that's what I think it was because you know when you first get an album, like, yeah, you kind of like, scan the title, you kind of like, okay, I feel like it's gonna, yeah, this is gonna be the vibe. You're not as the I'm first going. person to say that, by the way. So you're in good company I'm with, glad with I'm the not. people who have said that, like, oh, oh, this is what this is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's hear it. I love that features a mess. <laughs> it makes me laugh. I love it, man. <laughs> oh, thanks. 
Uh, so that that song was originally an idea that Calvin Harris sent to me, mm. just like baseline groove type thing, and uh, it was a little bit faster than that too. It was on some like real off the wall vibes. Oh wow! But then Timbaland and I got a hold of it, and Tim made this really sort of wise decision on all the stuff that we worked together on. He had started this this thing called Beat Club that he brought me in on, right? And he just really wanted to find new producers and and he was just racking up all these, like um, this amazing talent. And he brought some some guys in that that he was like, I'm gonna bring these guys in. These guys, you're gonna you're gonna vibe with these guys. And it was uh it was Fetty and Angel. Mm-hmm. And we also had Lawrence from 1500 in the studio. We had yeah. this. It James was, Fauntleroy was yep, in Yep. Yep. J- James and I wrote that together. Great. And, and he has nothing but amazing things to say about you, by the oh, way. Oh, really? James has like, and he, oh, he has no qualms, it seems. Oh, no, he doesn't <laughs> you know? care. Yeah, he don't give a fuck. He is extremely honest. Yes. One of my favorite things about him. He's also a hilarious human. Very funny person. Like, I was like, you, you could host a hilarious podcast yourself. But yeah, Lawrence uh, Dobson from 1500 as well. Like, that's a perfect sort of scene to set for you for how this album was made. It was like, bring them in, Mm. bring them in. The more the merrier. You know, I'm not precious with this. Let's just, let's have a good time. Let's make great songs. Like I said, let's have a blast doing this and that energy will come through. And so we took, we took what Calvin had sent, slowed it down a little bit and started doing our thing to it. And then of course, as that song I'm excited for my fans specifically to hear that song because it really is like Tim and I in our bag, along with these this other talent that he brought in that are yeah. basically like, you know, have listened to a lot of our music together previously. Yeah. Well, you guys are the archetype in a lot of ways for like what, there's a good amount of people that are like, they look to what y'all did together <laughs> in terms of what they want to make. So it's no shock, no surprise. I'll tell him you said that. But... You know, like as that song gets to the end, there's that whole interlude at the end, right? Where it's like, oh, okay, this is definitely, you feel that sort of future sex love sounds vibe of how it kind of turns into a a whole completely different song. Yeah. Have you tried working with Pharrell or the Neptunes more generally, like Chad and Pharrell? I have done some stuff with Pharrell that that is in the vault recently that might see the light of day. Soon in the future somewhere. Okay. Right. Future is a mess, man. <sighs> future is a the mess. Future is a mess. <laughs> Fuck it, just drop it, man. <laughs> we need it now, then. Well, you I know? said I, t- I told you I had a hundred songs and then <sighs> narrowed it down to eighteen. So yeah, these are the songs that all felt like the book. Yeah. These are the chapters of this book. But yeah, you know, make no make no mistake. Like Pharrell and I have still have great synergy, and we have some music that we've made that I know will come out. So I'm excited about that too. I would love to hear that. I would love to hear that. Yeah. All in due time. All in due time. <laughs> Speaking of the future, future is a mess. I was reading that Usher said he's been on you about doing a collaborative album. Not recently. Not recently? No, no, no. He said that uh, He was been recently. very busy recently. Well, yeah. he's been, yeah, well, yes, he has been. <laughs> with an incredible yeah. uh, uh, residency. Mm-hmm. And, Usher, you know, Usher, and Usher's an icon, man. That's a bad man. Would you do a record with him? Of course. I think it just has to be the right one. We've actually we we actually went in the studio. I, originally, I think I think it was one of those things where I was maybe gonna go in the studio and write something for a, one of his upcoming albums. Just mess around. Yeah. I just don't think we. I don't think we ever found it. Got it. Maybe we also just didn't make enough time. I don't know. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like going to it with that patience mindset. I know. You know what I, I mean? know. I know. Yeah. Well, we should get in the studio anyway. I mean, that would that would be a, a lot of fun. Usher's the man. Yeah. Let's do one more. I want to talk about Memphis. Let's let's play Memphis. Okay. And that's one. That's really hard to cut off. <laughs> that's really hard not to play. <laughs> that's a whole. Yeah. Th- that from start to finish is a whole message for sure. It's like it feels almost like a diary excerpt. That's that's what I, that's the way it feels to me, man. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know you, but you've been in my life how long, and mm-hmm. I can only imagine like the pressure and the craziness of your career. I mean, I, I can only imagine what it's been. You know, you started with conditions, and and then you wanted to play one more, and you played Memphis, and I don't find that there's much irony to that because when I finished those two songs, I said these have to be the bookends of the album. Mm. And 
you know, Memphis is an extremely personal song, but I think it was important to me the way that it sounded, like you said, the way that it felt. There's no moment for me where I've been ungrateful about how challenging it can be. This is not like a... I'm not saying this in some sort of braggy type of way. I have a very unique life where I've grown up in this industry from a very young age. And I think you go through life and you learn things about yourself and you go through bad experiences, you go through highs and lows. And that's why that visual in my mind, like being in the clouds, you know, and people seeing you up there that the first thing you hear people say is like, you can't be crying from up there, you know? And, and I'm not necessarily saying that I am. Where that song, where that song sort of, where I started to find the inspiration for it, again, I found myself remembering when I was first moving out of Memphis. And it's kind of funny now that I'm thinking about it now, I remember when I got chosen for like Star Search. Mm -hmm which if you're young and you're listening to this right now, it was the original American Idol. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. by the way, like it was the biggest thing on television. Huge. Yeah. And I remember when I got chosen to go be on the show, like the kids from my school that were my friends, like came and met me at the airport with signs saying, good luck, Justin. You know what I mean? And I think back to those moments with such fondness, but also like that 10 year old feeling that pressure yeah. to be great. And, you know, at times being a artist who a a achieves a certain amount of success can lead to weirdly enough, like an incredible feeling of isolation. And I think that that's when you have to really you have to take a, a second to say, who am I right now? And how have these experiences affected me all up until this moment? Because that's really the best way to move forward, right? In your own sort of personal constitution. And sometimes I've had lows with it and sometimes I've had extreme highs with it. And I think when you get older and you're able to metabolize that, I couldn't have written that song before now, you know, because I wasn't able to see how something that I didn't pay any attention to affected me in so many ways. Like I said, good and bad. But but like I said, I, in that song with I'm everything you thought I was, I'm everything I thought I was, it was everything I thought it was. And, and that's really wrapped around these ideas that once you finish a piece of art and you put it out there, it's going to be everything to somebody and something else to somebody else and something else to the next person. Mm. And... I guess I just felt like it was my turn to say, this is what it is to me. Mm. And so that's why it's important that it's the first song on the album. Originally, I, I wasn't going to call it Memphis, but m my best friend, you know, was sitting next to me. He said, you should call this Memphis because it really reminds me of like you coming out of Memphis and all of us like being so proud of you to to go out and, and, and dare to dream, yeah. right? But I, I don't know, I think, it's, I think it's important to, important to see every sliver of the whole picture and be able to put them in their place for yourself. Yeah, that, that's what that song is. That kind of, um, kind of like deeply personal songwriting, mm -hmm. does it feel comfortable? It felt comfortable on this song. All songs, even though you might just be writing them because you want to try to achieve the the sort of uh, entendres of the concept of the song, or you could be, you know, connecting the dots for the narrative of the song. They're all going to subconsciously come from a deeply personal place. I think, I, like, I guess, like I said, I think being able to put them in their place and once it's done, you know, it's like, whew. Yeah. You know, if, if they are deeply personal or if they're a song like No Angels, where it's like, you know, let me explore all the ideas of what No Angels means or, yeah. you know, what if we put them on the dance floor? Oh, yeah, there's No Angels on the dance floor. Yeah. 
every <laughs> you know what i mean like that's a that's a concept we can all understand right yeah. and have fun with yeah i think whether a song is deeply personal or not as an artist you're always putting your heart on your sleeve you know and and sometimes that can be a very isolating place a very a very anxious experience yeah but the more i've understood that again i remember hearing rick rubin say this that people's reaction to a piece of art says everything about them good or bad and i don't know i guess that thinking about that concept really frees me up yeah they're going to be personal for the listener too yeah i think that's an amazing thing that's the connection have you thought about playing this record live yet yeah it's been interesting right now because we're going on tour really soon so it's been interesting to try to think about what songs i'm going to play live yeah i think once the album's out and it's living in the world i think i'll quickly have a feel not just based on like what people are responding to but more yeah. so myself yeah you know like how i how i feel about it being out in the world yeah there really is a difference mm -hmm. when you release something versus when it's not you know like even now even though it's like people some people have heard and you've gotten feedback and sure and especially to think about you work on and off for three or four years on a project i think the difference is for me now um before it was like oh god you know <laughs> which I think a lot of us d go through as artists. Sure. I think the difference is now for me, it's like, wow, you know, like <laughs> what a blessing, you know? And, and I don't know, I just feel really grateful in this moment. There's so many, we've talked about so many people and they've all conspired to my story yeah. and, and to be part of my journey. And I'm so grateful for all of them. The ones that I know personally and the ones that i don't even know at all yeah personally yeah. that i think i can really see the value in that at this point in my life and and i think that's why this album feels the way that it feels for me that's beautiful man thank that's really you. beautiful thank you i mean thank you for the record thank you for making the time to speak about of the record course, and putting it together i mean it's really beautiful and uh can't wait to see you on the road, man. Yeah, come see us. Absolutely. We'll, we'll make it do as Ray Charles said. We'll make <laughs> it, it do, do what it do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Justin Timberlake for chopping it up about his new album, Everything I Thought It Was. You can hear it along with our favorite songs featuring JT on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced and edited by Leah Rose with marketing help from Eric Sandler and Jordan McMillan. Our engineer is Ben Tolliday. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like this show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.